stop running from yourself. Welcome friends to Someone Gets Me. Today we're going to talk about what happens when we run from ourselves and the consequences of that. And of course, some tips on how not to, how to stop that, how to stop running from ourselves. This topic came to me because I was reflecting just on my life and on some of the past things with all the changes happening. And I recall when I was the clinical director of, of a couple different substance abuse treatment centers that I had counselors working for me that were running from themselves. They were running from their own consciousness, from their own inner awareness. They were living under the belief that I know this certain topic from school, and then that's all there is. There's no expansion or growth or nuance to it. Now, one of the substance abuse treatment centers that I'm that I'm recalling was di was geared toward the gifted creative people. The other one, not so much, but the same thing happens. When you're a healer or a helper or somebody who is a coach or a mentor, any of those things, if you're running from yourself, knowingly or unknowingly, consciously or unconsciously, the people you're working with can only go so far. And then there's a ceiling there because you can't walk someone to a place you've never been as far as awareness goes. It's, it's just not how it works, which is why a lot of the gifted people who come to me for mentoring work, because that's uh, an expansion of coaching and it's not therapy. So it's a much more holistic, um, overall life awareness enhancement situation. That's what mentoring is. It's much greater than what people realize. In fact, most of my clients go, oh, I'm getting much more than I thought I was going to get when they begin working with me because my model is something that's expansive and nuanced. So anyway, back to um, these people, these counselors. Well, both of them that I'm thinking of, and I'm sure there were more, but they were the two that popped in my mind this morning, run from themselves and were running from themselves. I don't know where they are today because we're talking you know, 20 years ago. But what happens is we inadvertently stop and stunt our own growth, but we also stunt the growth of the people that we say we're helping, whether it's our own children, our family members, or it's part of our work. So I want to talk about the consequence of running from ourselves and what to do and how come it's even an issue. So when a human runs from ourselves, what that means is not running jogging necessarily, but it's an inner running, right? I don't want to look at the darkness. I'm afraid of who I am. What if they think I'm an imposter, right? What if I can't do it? All of those are examples of running from ourselves. Another example of running from ourselves is being emotionally stunted or um, shut down or dysregulated. And one of the counselors I'm talking about, whenever we would be in a group therapy session and maybe I was co-leading it with that person and any one of the clients became very emotional, which when you're healing from deep grief, emotions happen. And if a client became very emotional, like crying or something, this particular person always would find a way to interrupt it, to analyze it, figure it, stop it, redirect it without allowing that person to have the full expression and get on the other side of it to then gain awareness and heal. That's an example of running from ourselves. Oh, I'm feeling a little bit of pain. And so I'm going to run from it. I'm going to medicate it with substances or food or sex or distraction or overthinking, or I have to learn things, right? If I learn it, I'll get it. I have clients that have told me this over and over. Now, remember, I've been doing this 40 years, so I have lots of stories, <laughs> um, but I have people who have um, said, well, just give, you know, pull out the notebook, just give me the answer. Give me what I need. Give me the outline. Give me the document that will tell me the step-by-step -step and I'll follow those steps and that's all there is. But that's not how it works. That's a part of it, but that's not how it works. So we run from ourselves by the delusion or convincing ourselves that it's a simple solution that if I only knew the answer or if I had like the cliff note version of the situation of the of the solution i could figure it out from there it's like saying just give me the um abstract to the to the paper and i'll figure out the rest but that's not how it works one of the key issues here is that humans our brains our being 
gifts are meant to be in relation with others of the same species. We are meant, we are designed to be in relationship. And so when we are siloed or we're isolated or we in, we knowingly or unknowingly shut ourselves down and isolate our own experience, our emotions, our spiritual awareness, our insights, our physical proximity to others, then we are running from ourselves. And this is very different than somebody who's maybe an introvert like me and we spend a lot of time alone. This could be different than somebody who says, oh, you know, part of my um, growth and part of my inner awareness is silence and time with myself. That's different than running from ourselves. Have you ever taken a nap in the middle of the day? Not because you were tired, but because you wanted to shut your system down. That's a way of running from ourselves. Yeah. Have you ever imbibed with just a little bit more alcohol and you're not an alcoholic, but you did a little bit more than you should have, or maybe a lot more? And it's not necessarily addiction, but like, why did you do that? I have a friend of mine who even told me that one time who said, who was out at a restaurant and said that it was noisy and it was distracting. And so she intentionally got drunk so that she wouldn't have to experience all the energy around her rather than either breathing through it, staying with awareness and maybe excusing herself from that experience or finding another way other than putting neurotoxins into her body, right? There's ways to stop running from ourselves. Another way people run from themselves is what I call analysis paralysis um, and the overthinking spiral. I was talking to a person another time and we're talking about growth and consciousness and and um, being beneficial presence on the planet. And we're in this great conversation and it's all yummy and great. And, and I said to my friend, I said, so, you know, it's important that we continue to keep expanding and growing because the world is always expanding and growing. And that's how we know we're not running from ourselves. And so this person immediately just started doing this. Well, then this is what you're saying and had distilled down a few like clips, if you will, of what I said, and tried to convert this nonlinear awareness and experience into a line item list. That doesn't work, my friends. The cognitive line item list mental capacity only part of our reality is, is the smallest fraction. It's our emotions that get us to do things. That's the driving force. It's our spiritual nature, our essence, if you will, that is driving the bus or should be driving the bus, right? And so the intellect is great, but it's got a limited use. So we're most powerful when we bring our mental self to, along with our intuition, which is the highest form of intelligence. That's our connection to our essence, our emotions, our ability and willingness to connect with others, whether it's other humans, other animals, nature, connection is the correction. It's these things that are so vitally important for humanity, for our own lives, for generally a nice life experience, right? Because what I see out here in the world right now is a lot of um, discontent, a lot of attacking, a lot of greed, lots of greed, lots of blame, blame other people. We're going to blame everybody. But remember when you're pointing your finger away, there's three pointing back at you. So whatever you're saying about someone else, there's a piece of you that is the same as that person. Now, it may not look the same on the outside. And that's where a lot of people get all defensive. Oh, you're so, not right, Diane. Well, it's not true. What happens is if I'm pointing the finger and I'm saying you, you, you know, you, some existential other person or somebody I disagree with, you're, you know, you're this, that, and the other thing. Well, what motivates that person's greed or anger or attacking? What motivates that? Well, we know that all anger is a secondary feeling. All anger is a secondary feeling that comes from unresolved pain. It escalates when the fear level rises. So if I'm walking around with a lot of pain, known and unknown, conscious and unconscious, and then you show up and you're like a mirror to me, showing me something that I don't want to see, pain-wise. 
then that fear of, oh, I don't want to see that, will escalate the pain. And pretty soon, somebody's probably not acting so good, right? So the people who do things that we really disagree with or are um, otherwise not doing the right thing, those people have a lot of unresolved pain. And there's eight levels of pain. There's eight kinds of pain that are cumulative and synergistic. So when we have lots of those different pains, they get converted into anger because anger, which comes in the form of blame, resentment, and all this acting out we see, anger is a great way to blow off steam. Kind of like humans are walking around pressure cookers. And so the pain is, is all the stuff in the pot. We want to have the least amount of stuff in the pot. The flame that gets that pressure cooker to raise pressure and eventually explode is fear. There's fear of not getting what I want and fear of losing what I have. And I don't know about you, but when I look around, those two fears are quite prevalent in our world because people are afraid of losing what they have or not getting what they want. And that fear turns up the flame underneath the pressure cooker that's filled with all their unresolved pain, known and unknown. So the people refusing to do their work, the people who are running from themselves, really, are the ones who are acting out the most because they're unwilling to look at the dark side of themselves. Darkness meaning sadness, grief, pain, discord, disconnection. Sometimes people act out because their life is going really well. They don't know how to um, handle being happy or successful because maybe that's a new experience too. There's that pain. So the eight levels of pain, or the eight kinds of pain really, are cumulative and synergistic. So they're cumulative during the course of a day and also over our lifetime. Synergistic meaning that they can show up in a bigger way than this, the sum of the parts. So I've had a lot of clients come to me and say, well, I've never had anything big happen to me. Well, you don't have to have anything big have, have happened to you to have lots of pain that you're converting into anger. Now, anger can look like depression. It can look like frustration, irritation. It can look like shutdown, like, dis like complete disconnection. It can look like apathy. It comes out in a lot of different ways. It's just not the external expression. In fact, anger turned inward is depression and turned inward exponentially is when people get hopeless and suicidal. That anger comes from these eight kinds of pain. The eight kinds of pain are what need to be dealt with. People don't want to do that. They run from themselves. Even people who are helpers, they don't want to look at it. And, um, and so part of our challenge here in the world is to pull up our bootstraps, if you will, and say, hold on a second. Instead of running from myself, I'm going to turn and look within and see what it is that needs to be rectified, what it is that's prickly, what it is that isn't serving me, and make choices that support my growth and my welfare in whatever arena it is. Now, cumulative pain can really get us over time because some people are still dealing with trauma from childhood or even the DNA alterations from intergenerational trauma. That's a big deal. But we also have it during the course of a day. Have you ever had a day where maybe you had a chronic backache or a chronic headache or something just like, just like under the radar, you know, you notice it, but you just keep pushing through? I'm sure you have because we all have, I think. Well, then by the end of the day, something, something happens. You know, you, you drop something by accident or, or something, you know, doesn't go the way you think or whatever. You stub your toe, something. And the response is huge. Like we blow up and get really angry and really upset or maybe even so angry that we then start crying because that's what this is. The anger erupts like a volcano and then the person's crying. Well, that the anger is really an expression of pain. So... That is a, an example of cumulative pain over a day because your system's been moderating this kind of low-grade pain all day long, and by the evening, it's tired. And so anything can trip it, and then pretty soon we're blowing up, and then we're crying to release the pain like the valve of the pressure cooker in order to try to function. That, my friends, is not a healthy way to live every day all the time. It's not. 
you know, and, and even in my own life with the loss of my beloved Maggie recently and lots of other things going on in my life, even in the face of all of these things, they're helping me see parts of me that were lurking in the shadows that it's time to say, oh, I see you. I see you old pain. I see you old grief. And it's time to shine the light of truth on those things so it can be released and not run our lives anymore. So if you're angry a lot or frustrated or irritated or people annoy you, look at those eight areas of pain because that is where the solution is. Because once you do your healing, once you've rectified it, I use the word rectify versus heal a lot of the times, but once you've done it, once you've taken care of it, you've looked at it and said, I see you, you don't serve me, I can release you, and you do the work, which sometimes it's a lot faster than other times. Sometimes it's easier than other times. It's okay. But once you do that, the issue at hand, the person at hand, the challenge at hand becomes a non-issue. If it's a work-related situation, they may quit or leave, or you're going to offer another job, or the company changes, or somebody gets laid off somehow or other, that no, is no longer in your world. Or the person stays in your world, and you don't even notice it anymore. Like, you know, wow, I used to be annoyed by this thing they were doing, and now I'm, I don't even notice it. So once you've done the work, then the things that used to stick poke those pains no longer affect you in the same way. You might notice it, but you don't have a response. So I always tell people, the bigger our response to something, the more we know that we have unresolved pain that this thing is showing us. So if you look around the world and you see people with all this anger and all this hostility and all this hate and all this greed, what they're telling you is they're deeply hurting little, little five-year-olds, three-year-olds that have no idea what to do, no inner compass, nobody helping them. They don't want the help sometimes. And then they end up paying the price. It's particularly sad when it's a, fan, a parent, right? Because then now the child inherits all that pain. So anyway, stop running from yourself. Work on yourself. So you might want to start breathing, right? Every day, breathe. That's good for you. You also might want to start talking to other people in the know who are working on growing on themselves, either a really good advisor, mentor, consultant, counselor, therapist, but you have to make sure that that person is growing along the lines you want to. It's just not book knowledge. Make sure that their practices and the way they are operating aligns with you. There's no wrong answer. It's about alignment. Make sure that you're being honest with yourself and you're growing in your own awareness. And make sure you realize there's no finish line and nobody's ever done. And you can't learn, then you can't read the next book, listen to the next podcast, read the next thing and be done. We are never done. There's no finish line. So it's always exciting to keep growing. And sometimes it's, it's tiring. And sometimes we need extra time for ourselves. And a lot of times it's like finger painting. It's very messy. And the joy and the beauty and the connection and the love that happens as a result of doing the messy finger painting is beyond measure. So friends, I hope that this episode has served you well. And there's so much more I could say about it. Um, but this is enough for today, I think. So if you have any questions or comments, you can um, always email me. The email is in the show notes. And I'm happy to assist in any way that I can um, so that we all can continue to expand in goosebumps. So we all can continue to expand and we can grow and we don't have to be trapped in the delusion that it's all in our mind and we have to think our way through this. That's not the answer. If it was, we wouldn't be in the jam in the, the world that we are now. It's not the answer. Smart people sometimes can create more damage because they think they can outthink the problems, outthink the grief, outthink the trauma. That causes more damage. So just because someone's smart doesn't mean that they're not running from themselves. In fact, smart people run from themselves more than others at first until they wake up. So it's time. It's time, everybody. So remember that you, my friend, our rock star. You're here on purpose with a purpose and it's time to stop running. It's time to go 
within and clear out all the old wreckage, all the old junk from our own lives and the generations behind us so that the generations in front of us and the rest of our own lives can be filled with joy and connection and promise and grace and gratitude and love. Until the next episode of Someone Gets Me, be well.